don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Don't be intimidated when people don't accept what you say. Do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Remember what therefore is. In light of what I just said, don't be afraid. Why? Because everything, everything that you believe, everything that you say, there are going to be people all around you who say, it's really not true. The Bible's not true. The gospel's not true. What the Bible has to say couldn't possibly be true. But what Jesus is saying is, that's exactly wrong. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Jesus provides a powerful incentive against fear. Why? Because one day the truth is going to be known. The truth will pre prevail. The sinister cloak of evil that hides the persecutor's deeds will be stripped away. The truth will come to light. The testimony of the believer's faith will be exonerated. The persecutions will be seen as a light affliction compared to the weight of glory. Right now, the gospel is hidden in part. Its truth is covered in part. But one day, all the lies will be stripped away and the truth will be known. And over and over again, the reoccurring theme in the Bible is, no, it is true. No, it is true. You see, the problem of sin is still a problem and Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. It's true. The gospel is true. We don't have to be afraid. Why? Because the gospel's true. It shouldn't just simply be in the back of your mind. It should be in the front of your mind and the front of your lips. You should be able to say with complete confidence, I know that the Bible's true. I know that the gospel message is true. I know there's a real God. I know that the real Jesus is the living Lord and Savior. I know that he really did die. I know that he really did rise from the dead. I know that this is the only source of hope in the world. All the cloak, all the dagger, all the disguise, all the deceit, all the secrets of men will one day be stripped away and everyone will see the truth. Paul writes about it and he says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One day, the Lord Jesus will reveal the abuse. He'll reveal all of the pain and the problems and the heartache that have been heaped on believers. The truth will be revealed, but I'm gonna need to tell you one more thing. The truth will be revealed and dealt with. Well, what about the damage to my home? What about the damage to my marriage? What about the damage to my, my career? What about the damage to my character and reputation? What about the, the pain and the difficulty that it's created in my family? The truth is gonna be known and the Lord will be vindicated and the Lord will restore your character and the Lord will restore your reputation. Just like he did with Joseph, just like he did with Daniel. Many believers are made objects of rejection and ridicule, but the true believer will be exalted according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, with a far greater weight of glory. The true believer will experience, according to what the New Testament says, the praise of God himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. The true believer, the Bible says, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his father, Matthew chapter 13 verse 43 one day every single person who didn't believe you whatever I tell you in the dark speak in the light and what you hear in the ear preach on the housetops the reason why I think that that's an interesting phrase is I think that it's, it's, there's a sense of intimacy and aloneness. It's something that he says to you when no one else is around. 
You're, you're, you're spending time with the Lord Jesus. And as you're spending time with him, he begins to speak to you about your life and about your family. What you hear in the ear, he says, preach on the housetops. Speak publicly and openly. Well, what if they want to hurt me? Verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Can we be hurt? The answer is yes. If you have a central nervous system, you can be hurt. If you're wired properly, you can experience pain. Jesus doesn't say, oh, and by the way, you won't experience pain. What Jesus is basically saying is, the persecutor can do no real damage. But in our mind and in our hearts, we sometimes think that it really is damaging. I could be hurt. I could lose my job. I could lose my reputation. I could lose, I could lose, I could lose. And remember, that's the essence of fear. The essence of fear is what I could lose. Here Jesus is saying the damage is always limited. But they could hurt us in this life. Yeah. They could take away our health, our freedom, our substance. They could take away a lot of different things. And Jesus says they can't take away what matters most. They can't take from you what they never gave you. They can't take from you what they never gave you. And what has Jesus given you? Love, life, real freedom, forgiveness, hope, the promise of eternal life. We can be separated from life, but we can't be separated from eternal life. We can be cut off from a lot of things, but we can't be cut off from the most important thing, his love his grace, his mercy, his compassion. But the risk of persecution is always seen in light of life's greatest reward. And that's the person who hears the truth, believes the truth, and is forever changed by the truth. Fear in its most fundamental property is loss. And so here, what he's basically inviting the listener to do is to think carefully and biblically about the real God. Here, him isn't Satan. Here, it's the true and living God. It's the self-existent God. We're afraid we're gonna lose something. So Jesus directs our fear to the one who's the sovereign Lord, who's in charge of all possessions, who's in charge of all life. The Lord God is in charge of our body. He's in charge of our soul. He's in charge of our possessions. The Lord God creates the universe. He creates the body. He creates the soul. He's, the, he's ultimately in charge of where we came from and where we are and where we're going. But what does the fear of God bring? Again, when the Bible speaks of the fear of God, it means a healthy respect. It means a reverence of his holy being and his holy attributes. God is holy and righteous and just and pure and merciful. He is kind and good. In the context of a personal God, who has authority over every realm of human existence, it makes perfect sense to me. One day the truth will come out in verse 26. The persecutor's power is always limited in verse 28. Now we learn that God deeply, personally, wonderfully cares about you. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? We can remain faithful in the presence of persecution. We can remain committed in the presence of rejection. 
So Jesus begins and he says, we won't ignore the persecution. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. The passage is a warning and so is the statement. No disciple is above his teacher. In what sense? The Lord will suffer rejection, persecution, opposition, and so will the disciple. Here Jesus speaks of the fact of the expectation and the fact of the persecution. Jesus calls his disciples, remember in the passage, to himself with a message from himself, empowering them by his own power. And then he sends them from himself. Jesus empowers them. How did people receive Jesus? Some of them accepted him. Most of them rejected him. Matthew Henry wrote, quote, Christ's followers cannot expect better treatment in the world than their master had, unquote. And that's true. And that's the point. Jesus is in effect saying, in all of your dealings with everyone everywhere, I want you to be aware of how they treated me. And you should take that as a clue of how you will be treated. In verse 25, that's why he says, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of the household? I want you to note the statement in verse 25. It is enough. Don't overlook it. When Jesus says it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, packed in that single statement is a powerful reality. God has done everything for the believer. It is enough. It, you don't know it yet, perhaps, because at this particular moment, you may know that Jesus came and that he loves you and that he died for you and that he rose from the dead and he's sending a powerful Holy Spirit to, to live inside of you. He's orchestrating a mechanism so that everything you need will be given to you. It is enough. God has done enough for the believer. Not only is God aware of the sparrow's existence, but God is deeply involved in the minute details of the sparrow's life cycle. The sparrow is isn't forgotten. God's providence is the truth that God sees everything, that he knows everything, that he cares and orchestrates all things, every event, every detail at the most minute level. The Lord God is omniscient, which means that he knows everything completely. He's all powerful, omnipotent, which means that he has all power. He's able to control all events in our life. God can and will control the minute details of reality. He sees all things and he causes all things to work together. He orchestrates them in such a way, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 115, 12, the Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. God's knowledge is omniscience. God's power is omnipotence. God's love and God's care, even the injuries the injuries and pain inflicted on believers by evil men. God is completely aware of it. His ultimate purposes will be fulfilled because the Lord gives meaning and purpose and significance to everything that is your life. And so in verse 32, it says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. 
So what does it mean to confess Christ? I think it means to tell the truth about Jesus. And of course, I think it means to tell the truth when it's the most difficult time to do it. This is in your home and in the classroom and in the courtroom and in the bedroom and in the boardroom. This is in the place where you've been called to live. The favor of men or the favor of God. How can we remain silent and remain faithful? The Bible seems to indicate the strong sentiment that that's not possible. We reveal the situation. Darkness thrives in cover-ups and deception and half-truth and whole lies. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. Remember, 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 God will have the final say.